Now, what we're going to show you is some lifts that were taken out of the movie. Now, there's a lot of laser discs where like the director kind of redoes things and puts scenes back in the movie that he took out and whatever, and they have these like you know, definitive director's editions. Now, I didn't do that on this because <laughs> I made the movie I wanted to make the first time, but I still had scenes that I took out. All right, that I liked and that I generally like and everything, but you know, the film you can have too much of a good thing. So we took them out, and now, now I'm not putting them back in the movie because the movie's the way it's supposed to be. But here in this section, just if you're fans of the movie, you can look at them and just see them for yourself. Now, it's really kind of interesting, actually, when you make a movie because there'll be about, you know, 75 to almost 80% of it, all right, is just fine and the people you're making it with, everyone likes it, but there's about, usually about like five scenes that kind of stick out from the movie, sort of like a sore thumb, that kind of draws attention. And everyone's like, oh, do we need this scene? Do we need that scene, da da da? I don't know, I don't know about this scene, I don't know about that scene. So you're always like arguing about like five scenes. Now the thing is, some of them, yes, they stick out, but they're supposed to stick out. You know, it's, that's supposed to be how it is. And some of them stick out and they shouldn't, all right? And so the whole, thing is trying to decide, you know, like the Paul Newman says in Color of Money, you know when to say yes when it's time to say yes, and no when it's time to say no, everyone goes home on a Cadillac. So that's the thing here. You gotta figure out as a director which scenes do you want to keep just because you like them, and which scenes you're actually right about. That yes, maybe they do call attention to themselves, but they should. So that's it. These are the scenes that didn't make the cut, but I like them anyway. And I hope you do too. Now, first scene coming up is uh, the scene between Eric Stoltz and John Travolta when uh, uh, John is buying the heroin. Now, in that scene, originally, there was a big, long monologue, all right, that uh, Eric Stoltz uh, gave. And I love the monologue, It's I and I, I think Eric did a great job with it. But again, it was one of those things where it was just like a little too much. We wanted to hurry up and get to the date by the time we got to uh, that scene in the movie. So we took out Eric's monologue. And, but now, I'm gonna, we're gonna show you the whole scene over again, but with the monologue intact. Here it goes. Take it away. Still got your Malibu? Oh, man. You know what some fucker did the other day? What? Fucking cheated. Oh, man. That's fucked up. Tell me about it. I had it in storage for three years. It was out five days, and some dickless piece of shit fucked with it. They should be fucking killed, man. No trial, no jury, straight to execution. Boy, I wish I could have caught him doing it. I'd have given anything to catch that asshole doing it. It'd have been worth him doing it, just so I could have caught him doing it. Yeah, it's like last week, I had to go down to Panorama City. Now, when I go to Panorama City, I might as well be going to fucking Nebraska. I mean, I'm about as familiar with both of them. I, I mean, I just, I never go down there. Anyway, last week, I gotta go down there. So, I go down there. And guess what? I got lost. Now, you remember about 100 years ago when you used to get lost, you'd pull into a gas station and ask the guy for directions? Well, stupid me. Ooh, I'm suffering from the delusion that you can still do that. So I pull in this gas station, and I ask the guy directions. And he gives them to me. But there's something kind of funny about it, you know? I mean, I don't think too much about it. Maybe the guy's just, just funny. I don't know. But I notice it. So I drive off. <laughs> I got so fucking lost. Now, the only thing that I can figure is this dick bait at the gas station gave me the wrong directions on purpose. What a fucker. A fellow American comes to you asking for help, and you purposely fuck him up. I mean, what kind of world do we live in when people give people wrong directions on purpose? What's more chicken shit than fucking with a man's automobile? I mean, don't fuck with another man's vehicle. You don't do it. It's just against the rules. Thank you. Thank you. It's a scene uh, where Uma Thurman as Mia Wallace interviews John Travolta as Vincent Vega. It's when John has just come to her house and to pick her up and take her on the date to Jack Rabbit Slim's and she comes down and before you actually get a chance to really look at her, you just, uh, she comes down with a high eight camera and she's pointing it at John and she just kind of interviews him. You get the impression, possibly, that maybe she does this all the time whenever Marcella sends a goon to take her out to uh, dinner and stuff. She always kind of comes down there and kind of blows the guy's mind. But with John, it doesn't quite work because he's actually kind of into it a little bit. Now, 
thing is, this scene actually has a very checkered past because I'd actually written this scene about like five years ago or so. It was because I'd been like working on the basic idea for the Vincent Vega and Marcellus Wallace's wife for a very long time without ever having finished it. So this scene had existed for a while. So we shot it in the movie and everything. And the reason we took it out was basically because by the time that we actually got around to making it, um, it was becoming this cliche that all these movies made in the 90s were having all these young characters pointing high eight cameras at each other and doing these big confessional interviews uh, straight to the cameras, becoming this big, yeah, was every four out of every five movies had a scene like that. So it was quickly becoming a, a cliche. So I took it out for that. And the other reason I took it out was because I personally don't think this scene is that great. You know, I mean, to me, it sounds more like someone trying to write like me than me, <laughs> um, with all the little references in there. I still like the idea of uh, you're either an Elvis man or a Beatles man. You know, you, you can like Elvis, but you can like the Beatles, but no one likes them both equally. Somebody, at some point, you have to decide which one you like more, and that tells you who you are. I've always believed in that. All right, so that's the one aspect of the scene that I still like. But anyway. Here's a scene, and special note to Miss Thurman is the fact that uh, she actually handled the high eight during the, the video scene. Uh, so um, uh, so that she's the camera person. Also, one of the things very interesting is we did a test, you know, to transfer the high eight to film, see what it looked like. And we did many different tests. We had it widescreen at 235. We blew up the high eight to the cinemascope. And then we had uh, a 185, and then we had it just the normal video borders with just uh, black background, I mean, black on both sides uh, to see how the height looked. And I gotta tell you, it looked pretty good. It looked like bad 16 millimeters. So basically what I'm saying is if you want, have never made a film before and you wanna make a film, shoot it on high eight and transfer it to film. All right, because that's what I would do if I was having a film before. Here's the scene, bye. Smile. Camera. Ready to go? No, not yet. Do you ever see Barbara Walters interview the movie stars? Once or twice. Well, that's what this is. Pretend I'm Barbara Walters, and I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. About what? Oh, life, the world, yourself, whatever I might find interesting. I don't like answering questions. Oh, but that's not your problem. That's my problem. I'm the interviewer. I have to make you feel comfortable so you'll open up and reveal things you normally wouldn't. Okay, I'll ask you an easy one first. What's your name? Vincent Vega. Any relation to Suzanne Vega? <sighs> Suzanne Vega's my cousin. Suzanne Vega, the folk singer, is your cousin? Suzanne Vega's my, my cousin. She's become a folk singer. I sure as hell don't know nothing about it. Well, now I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions I've come up with that more or less tell me what kind of person I'm having dinner with. My theory is that when it comes to important subjects, there's only two ways a person can answer. Which way they choose tells you who that person is. For instance, there's only two kinds of people in the world. Beatles people and Elvis people. Now, Beatles people can like Elvis, and Elvis people can like Beatles, but nobody likes them both equally. Somewhere, you have to make a choice. And that choice tells you who you are. Well, now, I'm obviously not going to ask you that one, because you're definitely an Elvis man. But you're hip to where I'm coming from. Can you dig it? I can dig it. I knew that you could. OK, first question. Brady Bunch or the Partridge family? Partridge family. Hmm. On Rich Man, Poor Man, who did you like more, Peter Strauss or Nick Nolte? Nick Nolte, of course. What's your favorite way to say thanks in a foreign language? Merci beaucoup. In conversation, do you listen or wait to talk? I have to admit that I wait to talk, but I'm trying harder to listen. If you were Archie, who would you fuck first, Betty or Veronica? Betty. Cut. Print. Let's go eat. 
the next scene that we have is the Esmeralda cab scene. Now, we kept this scene in the movie, but initially, me and Sally edited a scene together that we were so happy with. Uh, as far as me and Sally were concerned, it was the best edited scene of, of the whole movie, except it just took way too long, right at a time, right in the middle of the movie when you don't want to take a long time. You want to hurry up and get Bruce on his way, get him to the apartment with his girlfriend, Fabian. So we ended up making a condensed version of that scene for the actual film. And again, like I said before, in the actual film, that version plays better. But as just a scene unto itself, me and Sally still like this first version that we cut together. So that's what we're going to have on here now. So now we have a bell and the and another bell. <laughs> and stop ringing that goddamn bell. All right, <laughs> get that cut out of here. Uh, now here's the Esmeralda cab scene, the long version. You're the fighter? Let me give you that idea. No, come on. You're him. I know you're him. Tell me you're him. <laughs> you killed the other boxing man. He's dead? The radio said he was dead. Sorry about that, Floyd. What does it feel like? It does what it feel like? Killing a man. <laughs> Beating another man to death with your bare hands. No, is a subject I have not interest in. You are the first person I have ever met who has killed somebody. So, what does it feel like to kill a man? I'll tell you what. Give me one of them cigarettes you got up there. I'll tell you all about it. Spanish, but I am Colombian. Pretty name. It means Esmeralda of the Wolves. Your name means Esmeralda of the Wolves? <laughs> Some hell you got there, honey. Thank you. And what is your name? Butch. Butch. What does it mean? I'm an American, honey. Our names don't mean shit. So. Moving right along, Esmeralda. What is it you want to know? I want to know what it feels like to kill a man. I couldn't tell you. I didn't know he was dead until you told me he was dead. Now that I know he's dead, you want to know how I feel about it? Feel the least bit bad about it. You wanna know why? 
this one right there. This is my boxer. When she said that, that's pretty much all there is to say about me. And a son of a bitch out there tonight, that Floyd, maybe once, one time, he was a boxer. He was, he was dead before he ever stepped foot in the ring. All I did was put the bastard out of his misery. <laughs> if he never was a boxer, that's what he gets for fucking up my sport. The next scene is uh, the scene with Monster Joe and Monster Joe's daughter, Raquel, played by uh, Dick Miller as Monster Joe and Julia Sweet as Raquel. Um, I ended up taking out this scene basically because, um, it's again, it's just, uh, for the, actually the same reason I ended up taking out most of these scenes, uh, except for the John Anuma scene, was it was just too much at that moment when we kind of just want to be moving along. Basically, we want to hurry up and get to the diner by this time and see John and Sam do their scene. Um, so there's a too much, but I still really like the scene. I love, in particular, love the scene between the wolf and Raquel, because I don't know, it's just you know, it's the closest I've ever come to writing a, a scene like Ernest Lubitsch or something. It's just kind of this like kind of little witty repartee. I'm not saying I'm as good, which the scene will verify, but uh, I just kind of it was just a different flavor that this scene and the dialogue had, and that, and that. So that's I always had a big, big fondness for it. And actually, of all these scenes, it's the one that I almost kept in. All right, you know, right down to the wire, and at the last minute, uh, we don't want to be here, unfortunately, but I won't be there. Uh, but it's here for all of its glory. And where this scene falls into the movie is right after um, when Jules and Vincent uh, and the wolf are at Jimmy's house. And just when they're getting ready to leave, and they go, we're going to go to Monster Joe's. Boom. All right, then it, would cut, then it cuts to the wolf working on his deal with Monster Joe. One other thing to, to note in here is the guy playing Monster Joe is Dick Miller, who's one of my favorite character actors. If you're a Joe Dante fan, he's in every Joe Dante movie, and he's been in, was in 72 Roger Corman movies, and it was just, um, just an honor to put him and Harvey Gattel in the same frame. Together. So anyway, here it is. It's the Monster Joe and Raquel scene. Uh, I said it before, I'll say it again. <laughs> Your business is always welcome. I don't think by now I've earned the equivalent of frequent flyer miles. Frequent flyer? Tell you what. If you ever need it, I'll dispose of a body part for free. How about an upgrade? You dispose a whole body for the price of a body part. Was that, no frills body disposal? <laughs> I can take out on there in the yellow pages. <laughs> on, I gotta run out past my accountant. Where's that reprobate daughter of yours? She's on the yard up to no good. Take care of it this afternoon. Hello, boyfriend. Hello, girlfriend. I swear, heartbreaker. Joe should change the name of this place to Beauty and the Beast Truck and Tow. Oh, you're prejudiced because you love me. Guilty. Now, business is done. It's time for pleasure. Time it is. It's time for bed. Oh, contraire, Senor Lobo. Do you have a different idea? Most definitely. What do you think? I think you're taking me out to breakfast. Well, you thought wrong. Oh, that's not fair. I never get to see you. Raquel, I've been up all night. I need sleep. You understand the concept of sleep? Yes, sleep is what you do after you've taken me to breakfast. <laughs> Just get used to the idea. Indulging me is the price of doing business at Monster Joe's Truck and Tow. Raquel. Come on, I haven't seen you in a long time. I miss you. You're taking me to breakfast. So it is written, so shall it be done. I'm my way, Rex. We cool? Like it never happened. All right. Yo, Vince. I apologize for being in your shit like I was, man. Hey, you got every right, man. I fucked up. Are they having a moment? Boys, this is Raquel. Someday, all this will be hers. <laughs> Hi. So, what's with the outfits? You guys going to a volleyball game or something? <laughs> Thanks. Maybe down Think nothing of it.
so. Marsala said you just got back from Amsterdam. Sure did. How long were you there? Uh, just over three years. I love Amsterdam. You been there? I go there about once a year to chill out for a month. No kidding. I didn't know that. Why would you? Hey, do you know a hash bar about three blocks from the Anne Frank house, the Cobra? You been at a Cobra? I mean, that's a real small place. How'd you know about the Cobra? I've known about the Cobra since Derek opened it. You know Derek? I've known Derek going on six years now. You're kidding. Derek and me are like buddies. So are Derek and I. There's a bone in my fucking mind. I mean, I practically lived at the Cobra. When I'm in Amsterdam, I literally live at the Cobra. I stay in the house with Derek and Petra. You stay at the Cobra? My picture's on the wall. Which picture? Um, you know the photos Derek has behind the bar? Well, there's one of Derek between two girls wearing uh, baseball jerseys. Petra's the one with the baseball cap, and the girl in the cowboy hat's me. That's you in a cowboy hat? So you're the one in a cowboy hat. Jesus Christ. I mean, these things like this make me realize how small the world is. I could have took you out. How come ourselves didn't hook us up? Oh, when I go to Amsterdam, I go alone to be alone. I could do it. I heard you did a pilot. That was my 15 minutes. What was it? It was a show about a team of female secret agents called Fox Force 5. What? Fox Force 5. Fox as in we're a bunch of foxy chicks. Force as in we're a force to be reckoned with. And five as in there's one, two, three, four, five of us. There was a blonde one, Somerset O'Neill. Do you know her? Hmm. She was a leader. There was a Japanese one, a black one, a French one, and a brunette one, me. And we all had these special skills. Somerset had a photographic memory. The Japanese fox was a kung fu master. The black girl was a demolition expert. French fox's speciality was sex. What was your specialty? Knives. Knives. <laughs> the character I played, Raven McCoy, her background was she grew up raised by circus performers. So, she grew up doing a knife act. According to the show, she was the deadliest woman in the world with a knife. But because she grew up in the circus, she was also something of an acrobat. So she could do illusions, she was a trapeze artist. When you're keeping the world safe from evil, you never know when being a trapeze artist is gonna come in handy. <laughs> and she knew a zillion old jokes. Her grandfather, an old vaudevillian, taught her. And if we would have got picked up, they would have worked in a gimmick where every show, I would have told another joke. You know an animal jokes? Well, I only got the chance to say one, because we only did one show. Tell me. It's corny. Don't be that way. Tell me. No, you wouldn't like it and I'd be embarrassed. You'd be emb You told like 50 million people and you can't tell me? I promise I won't laugh. That's what I'm afraid of, Vince. That's not what I meant, you know it. Well, now I'm definitely not gonna tell you because it's been built up too much. What a jip.